All right. Welcome back to the Ottawa studios of Inside My Canoe Head. I am your host, Dr. D. Today, we're going to talk about evacuation scenario and what does it look like when it rolls out and surprises the living crap out of you. So sit back, grab yourself your favorite beverage. Let's get at her. All right, thank you for joining us again, and welcome to the conclusion, the wrap-up, the second last day of our second week of the 10 weeks of practical preparedness here at Inside My Canoe Head and our parent company, Preparedness Labs Incorporated. Today, we are talking about evacuations. Now, that's the most dangerous scenario that a family could go through. It's the most dangerous thing that encompasses your planning and your considerations for emergency preparedness for your family, your household, or at the community level, including your corporate world. And again, to rehash what we said early on, if you plan for the most dangerous and last week's the most likely scenarios, and if you look at it as a spectrum, if you plan for the left edge and you plan for the right edge and you're good to go with well-rehearsed, structured, and understood plans, then everything in the middle becomes manageable because you've likely got it covered through some aspect of what you've already done. Far easier, far more manageable for the average family to simply have two plans related to incidents that are beyond their control, that are related to disasters. There's a third trifecta of preparedness plans, which will be the focus of next week's third week of practical preparedness. And that's a sudden and consequential loss of income. Because let me tell you, losing your house to a fire, that's impactful. Losing your job suddenly, that can be just as bad and consequential for the family. So look forward to that. But this week, we want to walk you through less so of a scenario of, you know, John and Jane are sitting there and XYZ happens to them, but more so how this normally rolls out. Now, evacuations are generally going to be voluntary or not, right? When you con- when you divide them into two sectors, they're going to be a voluntary, you know, you're leaving or mandatory, you're not. Now, depending on the jurisdiction you live in and depending on your personal lens you look through, mandatory evacuations are a lightning rod within the preparedness industry because there's a great discussion ongoing and irrespective of where you sit, it's a good discussion to need to have. Should the government have the legal authority to order you to leave your residence against your will? Should Not whether they should use that authority, but should the government have it at all? There's some great discussions about that. I'll leave it to you and your family and friends to talk about that. But generally, they're going to be voluntary or they're going to be mandatory. Those are the ones issued by your public sector emergency management organization. Somebody with an overseeing responsibility for the geographical area where you reside can issue a voluntary or mandatory order. They're either going to be immediate or slow burn. Immediate means... Holy, you know what? Something just occurred and you got to go and you've got to go now. That's the fire trucks up and down uh, and the police officers up and down the streets and the loudspeakers telling you to evacuate, evacuate now. Your social media is covered. You got here in Canada, Alert Ready is going nuts with the evacuation orders. That's a sudden and immediate evacuation due to a whole series of. Of events, And this is why we don't have a wildfire evacuation plan, an industrial accident evacuation plan, a flooding evacuation plan, a dam break evacuation plan. You know what I mean? Like you would go nuts with the number of possible evacuation plans. So we simply have an evacuation plan, full stop. Now, and that's an immediate. A slow burn evacuation is if you live on the East Coast or the southern coast of the United States of America, or the east coast of Canada, you get hit by hurricanes. It's happened for a million years, and it's going to happen for the next million years, right? They're a natural phenomena. It's part of climate. It's a weather anomaly. It happens. It's never going away. You should by now know that that could occur to you. And when it a named storm happens and a cone of probability is put on TV. Everybody sees it. You start to see the possibility and the potential impact where you live or areas that are important to you, friends, family, economic, whatever they may be. 
So that's a slow burn evacuation. You can see it coming. It's like your dog running away on the prairies. You can see him go for three days. Like you can see the likelihood of an evacuation increase, but you can see the start point, right? You know, there's a name storm. We think this is going to hit the East Coast. The Carolinas are likely going to be affected. That's like three days out, right? That's a slow burn evacuation, right? They're expected and possible or total surprise. And I mean that from a personal perspective. Now, think about what we've talked a lot about here. If you're if you hang around with us at Inside My Canoe Had a Lot, you'll know that season six, seven, eight were all about the theoretical foundation for emergency preparedness. And a lot of that we talked about is your personal risk profile, right? Your understanding, your capacity, your self confidence, your self efficacy right? Do you believe this is not going to happen to me? Or do you know somebody in your family who thinks that way? You know, these events don't happen to me, so I don't worry about it. The likelihood that I get smoked by a hurricane by living in Myrtle Beach is really, really low. I'm not going to worry about it. Or you can take that anywhere to any situation. You are surrounded by people who think that way. So it's not just a slow burn from the fact it's going away. It's what you have to look at that incredible, handsome, beautiful person in the mirror and ask yourself, am I being apathetic or I'm being beating avoidance behavior simply because I don't want to deal with the potential craziness that is an evacuation. So as a defense mechanism, I will choose to think that it's not going to happen to me. There's a lot of people that go down that route for a lot of things, getting fired, getting in a fight, uh, having your spouse do something, whatever it may be, or your kids failing out of school. It's not going to happen to me. I'm good. I'm a good person, right? That doesn't really work in preparedness, but if you're that person, that's a great thing to look in the mirror and go. Now, we came up with five tips on the last episode, and we just got to quickly rehash here so we frame you back in as we roll into the scenario. Number nine, know where you're going, right? Motel 6 is not the place to sort your freaking life out, right? Don't think you're just going to go to the next town over, grab a motel, hang out till the dust settles. Yeah, you're competing with everybody. And really, do you want to stuff you and the family you love into a one-room hotel at 200 bucks a night, eating 100 bucks of takeout food for four days when your house just burned down? Think about that. No. Know where you're going. Have a place, family or friends, 150, 200 kilometers or miles away that you can go to, no questions asked. Tip number two is know how you're getting there, right? So if you've got a planned destination, which you have to have, right? So now you have one or two routes to get there. You know how to do it without GPS at night. You understand what I'm saying? Like, don't rely on other systems that could fail for you to be able to successfully evacuate. So for example, my evacuation location is 153 kilometers from here. Uh, There is actually three routes and I know how to do them all at night with the power out and no lights other than my headlights. I know where to turn left, where to turn right, both on the main roads and the back roads, right? Number three is uh, go and warrant. And this is the number this this is the number one thing that I've actually I said on a podcast when I was the um, a guest at the Matter of Facts podcast in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Go when you're warned. When somebody says there's a likelihood of an upcoming evacuation, or they put, and, and in some jurisdictions they use this nomenclature. They say we're putting this area on notice. You're being put on notice. Notice that you may be ordered to evacuate. That's the time to GTFO. I'm dead serious. Don't wait. Because if you wait till it's mandatory and you wait till everybody's quote unquote serious about this, then every one of your neighbors are going to step out onto the road at the same time. Look around your neighborhood. Imagine if everybody jumped out at the same time And everybody tried to go through the neighborhoods and then access the arterial routes all at the same time. That's that parking lot of cars that you see on TV. That's failure, right? That's not a successful evacuation. That's failure. From a management perspective, from an emergency management perspective, lining people up on a highway so they can be taken out by the hazard is not an ideal scenario. So go and warn. Uh, Prep for continued operations at the next location. So the idea being is depending on what you do for a living, like 
I, I'm a part-time university professor. I have a bunch of consulting gigs and a bunch of other things like this. So I do that from a laptop. I need to be able to continue my normal operations when I get to my destination. And the reason for that is, is I don't know how long the destination is, right? That's outside my control. I have no idea how long I'll be there. So if it's kids' schools, if it's work, if it, whatever you can, you want to be able to as close to normal, provide normalcy as you can at your destination. And if you earn income that way, especially if you have a calamitous or a catastrophic event at your residence that you had to leave, your ability to continue to earn income is going to be exceptionally important. So you have to consider that as well. So that has to be part of your plan. And the fifth is your insurance. You need to know your intimate insurance policy like it's your best friend's second child. Like I'm dead serious here. If you don't know exactly and specifically without question, what are your responsibilities? Then you're in trouble. How many people out there right now, and you're going to look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself this, when you bought your home insurance, did you compete on price? So you took the lowest freaking price, the minimal acceptable legal standard that you required for the mortgage and you rocked it and you signed it and you went on and I'm covered, right? So you've just taken the minimal accept legally accepted standard product of which you probably haven't even read and you don't know what the exclusions are. You don't know what your responsibilities are. You don't know what the insurance company is going to pay out for a loss, a total loss, whether the insurance company reimburses receipts or not, how much they're going to pay for alternate accommodations, and whether that is an upfront or after the fact idea. You don't know whether you have a total loss walk away provision in your insurance or you don't. Like if you don't know what your insurance specifically has, you are setting yourself up for failure, right? You're going to find out potentially that your low cost option requires you to fund your rent in your second location while you still pay your mortgage. Because remember, if your house burns down and it's going to take two years to rebuild, you still have to make the mortgage payments on that house for those two years, even though it's not there anymore. That's how it works. Now, the insurance company gives you an alternate amount of money for your secondary residence, right? But imagine if your insurance company, because you chose the low cost option, wants to reimburse you with receipts, which means you have to pay your mortgage and you have to pay your new rent in your new place out of this magical income that you're making and then hope their six-week reimbursement program happens. Because guess what? You didn't read your insurance policy. So those are the five practical tips that we come up with. Those are evidence-based. Why those five? Because that's after a decade of study of emergency evacuations that have happened in urban and suburban areas in North America and the results and interviews that have come out of it from the research have told us that these are the five variables that when addressed, it's going to give you the greatest likelihood of a better post-event outcome. That's the purpose of preparedness, right? That's the difference here at Inside My Canoe Head and our parent company, Preparedness Labs Incorporated. Everything you hear on this podcast is not apocalyptic, right? We go by evidence. We know what the best advice is for evacuations because we've read the account of 10,000 people who've been evacuated over the last 30 years. Not because I think I know what I'm talking about. Not because I believe that this is the right way to go. Not because somebody with experience has told me. No, I look at the freaking evidence and I find out what, the people who had the best post-event outcomes, what did they do? What differentiated them from everybody else experiencing the same evacuation? What did they do differently? Then we tell you to do that. That's why the advice is what it is. So those are the five tips. So an evacuation is usually not the initiator. If you think about the evacuation as an event that occurs, it's usually not the initiator. It's a consequence, which means it's the result of a wildfire. It's the result of an industrial leak. It's the result of a dam break. It's the result of something else. So if you're paying attention with great situational awareness to the world around you, you will see consequences events approaching that have the possibility to lead to you being evacuated. It's essentially an event that needs you to leave. 
Uh, and guess what? Now, we're going to roll into the scenario now. So here are a couple of key things, considerations when you're thinking about your scenario. Again, we're not going to walk Tom and Jane uh, through their evacuation because that's just a bit ridiculous to be like a scenario novel here. But it never happens when everything times are perfect, right? If you think about Mr. Murphy, the theory of chaos, the universal theory of chaos, or however you want to look at it, an evacuation event is likely to occur when things are dispersed, when your family's dispersed, right? The likelihood of everybody sitting around the kitchen table on a Sunday morning with well rested, the gas tank full, and a bright, beautiful day that that's when an evacuation order comes is really, really unlikely, right? It's likely to happen when your people are dispersed. So think about you've got a family unit, two parents, three kids, kids are in school, parents are at work or at home, whatever your situation may be, and an evacuation order comes out, right? You've got kids in school. What's your plan? What's the school's plan? What does the school intend to do with your children when an evacuation order has been include has been issued for an area that includes schools? Remember, most jurisdictions there's only enough school buses for 50% of the students. That's why you have staggered start times, right? It's because the same set of school buses that drive the elementary circle back to pick up the high school students or vice versa, right? So the school board can't evacuate your children from the buildings, right? Or maybe they can, maybe they have a plan, but the likelihood is they can't evacuate all of the children. They're going to have to pick which 50% get evacuated and which 50% don't. Very important for you to know, what is your school's intent? If a mandatory evacuation sudden onset is ordered, what is the school's intent for your child? You need to figure this out ahead of time right? Because one of the consequences of rapid onset emergencies are the cell traffic gets jammed, right? There's only a certain volume of cell traffic that can happen. And in urban areas, it's generally never a problem until you have an emergency and everybody gets on board and tries to call everybody else or everybody gets on and tries to text everybody else. And all of a sudden the system becomes overloaded. Your messages are not delivered. You get that that explanation mark that drives everybody nuts on your cell phone that's not the time to try to figure out who's picking the kids up that's not trying to figure out when you pick the kids up what are you doing next that's an evacuation plan it's part of what we talk about in our book preparedness simplified it's available at preparednesslabs.ca seven dollars ebook uh, availability and we talk about these type of considerations. Who's going to pick up the kids from school and then what are you going to do next? When the event happens, if you're going to try to figure it out then, you're putting your family at uh, at an increased risk and you're behind the eight ball, right? If you have a well-rehearsed, well-understood situation, I don't have to call my spouse and say, go get the kids. I know my spouse is going to get the kids because that's their responsibility in the plan. I know my responsibility is to get kid three or to return to the house to recover certain items if I can. That type of thing. Like you have a very structured, communicated plan. Don't Rest your plan on the ability to communicate with your family when the event goes up. When the balloon goes up, if you need to talk to everybody to figure out what's going on, it's a bad day. And it always happens during bad weather. The cell towers are jammed. It's the most confusing, worst possible time. If you plan for your evacuation plan with your family for that scenario, then as things are far better, it's far easier to execute. And remember, when people evacuate, people are habitual. Human animals are habitual. Irrespective of what emergency management tells people, the vast majority of humans will evacuate the town based upon their normal routes. What route is comfortable to them? What route is habitual, right? You remember that old saying, people rise to the occasion in emergencies, right? Well, they don't. 
People fall to their level of training. And that's why high-end elite military units and high-end elite tactical police units do very well in high-stress environments because they train for them. They train repeatedly. So when they fall from where they are to their level of training, it's not a drop at all or a very small drop, right? They go into mode. They know what's coming next. They know what they're doing next. That's what a preparedness evacuation plan does for you. If you leave people to their own devices, right? If you just think, and, and I'm talking to the emergency managers out there, if you think you're going to tell people what evacuation routes to use when the emergency happens, you're putting your entire community at risk unnecessarily. People will take the routes that are most habitually comfortable to them because their body muscle movements. They'll go down this road. They'll turn right here because they normally always turn right here. That's what they will do. They will also fall in the herd mentality. If everybody's turning right and emergency management wants you to turn left, the vast majority of people are going to go right with the herd. That's what human beings do. So understanding all of these behaviors and incorporating that into your evacuation plan makes it great. So it's about executing a well understood and well rehearsed plan. What does that mean? It doesn't mean turning your family into an apocalyptic at risk community where everybody's jacked up and stressed out because you may scream bug out. Or if you remember in the old army days, crash harbor or something like that. And everybody's got to go, right? No. We here at Inside Mike and who had, again, based upon evidence, recommend a monthly preparedness plan review. So you have a family preparedness plan and inside that family preparedness plan is your trifecta of plans. You have a plan for the most likely, which is the power loss. You have the plan for evacuation, the most dangerous, and you have your income loss plan. You have all of that every, once a month. Now, mine is the first Sunday of every month. I sit down no more than 30 minutes. I pull out my plan. I review it. I have a look. Has anything changed? Is my priority the same or do I need to shift priority to another item? Has everybody understood? Now, you know your family better than I do. You know the frequency at which you need to have these discussions to remind them what their roles and responsibilities are. When they're young kids, you have one set of responsibilities for them. As they age, they gain more and more responsibility and they take it on more important uh, roles within the family preparedness plan, right? That's just part of leadership. It's just part of growing as a human being and, and handing out responsibility. You know your family. How often should you discuss it with your family? We're recommending based upon the evidence and research that we've done here at Preparedness Labs Incorporated that you review your plans every month. Because let's be clear, if you're one of these crazy nutcases that preparedness takes up, I don't know what, a couple hours every day or every weekend, you're, you're jacking up on your preparedness and your bug out stuff. And if, if you're consuming your life with preparedness, my friends, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it absolutely wrong. It's quite literally an investment of time and energy in the beginning. I'm unapologetically advocating for that, right? But once your plan is done and it's written, I'm talking once a month for 30 minutes and that's it. Preparedness takes no more than that. You get after it, you rock your incredible life and your plans are well understood by your family. And remember, the big thing to remind yourself when the shizzy hits the fizzy and the world goes pear-shaped, it's very simple, is know what you control. And what you control is your decisions and your actions. You control when you leave. You control the route you choose. You can control the destination you're going to, and you can control the kit and equipment that based upon your analysis, priceless items you've decided to take with you, right? That's what you control. But what you don't control is everything else. You don't control what others think. What other people are saying is the best idea to do. You don't control that. You don't control what the emergency management agency is telling you. You don't control the frequency by which they choose to communicate with the public. You don't control whether the emergency management thinks this is a mandatory or a voluntary evacuation order. You don't control crime. You don't control what happens when you're away from your family home. 
You don't control what others do. You need to be wary of the herd mentality. Everybody thinks that this is a good idea to sit around. Build your community of like-minded people. This type of preparedness and evacuation planning you share amongst your neighbors so everybody collectively thinks logically thinks through it and you can help people make decisions but in the end you can only control what you and your family do that's it you can't control anything else because you got to be wary of you're going to have a slew of people right it's about how you fusion and process information okay so if you get somebody says well i heard jane uh two blocks over say this or Muhammad just texted me he's seeing this happening here or Jim's seeing this happening over that you know what I mean like fusion and intelligence in the military is the idea that you're gathering multiple sources of confusing and conflicting information and you're using it to paint a picture right you're trying to paint an intelligence picture that's not built from a single source even dual sources of information you're going to get dozens of inputs And those inputs are going to come from things you see and hear, from what you hear on the radio, TV, etc. And you start to put together this intelligence picture of the battle space, right? So if you think about it, I call it intelligence preparation of the disaster space. So you start to get this visual image through situational awareness of what is going on around you. So you seek information, you listen to it, you don't dismiss it, but you take it into your cognitive picture to understand what's going on be wary of the people go well jim well you know i heard this is going on uh two streets over so we're doing this you're taking a singular piece of information and you're making a consequential decision that is a dangerous avenue it's also a dangerous avenue to sit around and wait till you have 100 percent of the information right those of you with military experience police experience, fire emergency services experience you know often at times we had to make consequential life decisions with 70 60 percent of the information we would have liked to have and that 40 percent missing is pretty freaking important but it didn't matter time said i had to make the call now based upon the 60 percent of information i have i have no more off i go gotta move you make the call in the end when you get the other 40 percent after the fact you're like well That might have changed the decision, but you can't do that. So you have to find a balance of what decisions you're comfortable with. But remember, go early. Go early when it looks like it's probably a good idea to evacuate. It's probably a good idea to evacuate. And as I said to uh, James, one of the hosts at Matter of Fact, the worst thing that can happen to you is you get to go visit your planned destination. You get a little family vacation about 100 kilometers away. Turned out it wasn't a big deal. The evacuation was called off. You come back home, even if you stayed overnight somewhere, your family had a little vacation. That's the worst thing that happens to you. The best thing that happens to you is you beat everybody else on the road. You and your community moved. You're at your destination You've got a plan. You're executing the plan. Even if you have a catastrophic loss, your house burned down because of a wildfire, right? Your house got knocked down in a hurricane in the sea, uh, in the surge waves that come from the hurt, whatever it may be, you're starting to rebuild your life based upon a foundation of a rock solid evacuation plan that you had, you've positioned your family for success. We think your family's worth it. I'm sure you'll agree. So remember the key for evacuation scenarios is to remember you're responsible for this to build the plan, take the five tips, all of the scenario ideas that we talked about today, write them on a whiteboard, write them on a piece of paper, walk, chalk, talk your family through it and come with a scenario that works. Because remember, it's like the worst thing that you are preparing for is a no notice, no poop, immediate ev- mandatory evacuation order from a sudden onset event when the family's dispersed and they're not all at home. How are you going to do that? Because if you're executing a plan, you're further ahead than people are running around like a chicken with their head cut off, banging away on their texting device and their cell phone, trying to get a hold of somebody to figure out what's going on. People are just doing and not trying to figure stuff out. It's brilliant. It's worked every time. 
Put your family first and do that. So thanks for joining us this week at Inside My Canoe Head. We appreciate all of your feedback. Now, whether good, bad, and different or otherwise, have drop us a, uh, a communication at jeff at preparednesslabs.ca. If you go over, the podcast has a website at www.insidemycanoehead.ca. There's a website there. It shows our previous episodes. There's a buy me a coffee button there. If you enjoy the podcast, you like what you hear, you think it's a lot of fun, and you'd like to support the author, me, Dr. D., you can buy me a coffee. Simple, go there, fill out the form, bang, I cover your credit card costs, no problem. Five bucks. Canadian, a lot less American, you buy me a nice cup of coffee. Otherwise, leave us a review. If you don't like what you hear and you think I'm wrong, tell me. I get those, and I respond to them. Absolutely, I respond to them. If you think there's something I got wrong, or if you think there's something you would love to hear on this podcast that I haven't covered, feel free, we'll interject, we'll make it happen. This is a free, absolutely unquestioned free advice podcast about emergency preparedness. We provide you with all the information that you need to rock an incredible life because it's built on a foundation of a preparedness plan and you've wrapped your blank, your life in a blanket of preparedness. So thanks again for joining us this week at Inside My Canoe Head as we close out week two of the 10 weeks of practical preparedness. Take care and stay safe.